I don't know where they come from. It seems highly unlikely that they evolved naturally into what they are now. Impossible, given what we know about evolution. Perhaps they are some kind of bioweapon created millennia ago by madmen for some long-forgotten war. If so, I suspect that their creators soon came to regret their creation. Or perhaps they came straight from the war. Possibly the lords of chaos themselves cast them out because they were too unpleasant. That quote comes to us from Jarv Advent, Senior Biologist, Inquisitorial Institute of Proctus Minor, on the topic of gene stealers. Welcome to another episode of Just in Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. Today, I want to talk to you about insects in a fantasy world. What they offer you from a plot perspective, how to design effective sentient races using insects, and how they can contribute to your magic and your economic aspects in your world. Before we get going with the video, please do remember to subscribe down below. If you'd like to support what I do here, I do have a Ko-fi account where you can donate any amount of money or become a monthly member with all the perks thereof. Or you can buy my book available on Amazon or read it if you have Kindle Unlimited. Okay, let's get cracking. First, let's talk about sentient species. The quote that I started this video with comes from the Warhammer 40k universe, and it's specifically in reference to the species called the Tyranid. They are an insectoid species that do not appear to have a home planet. They have hive ships and they travel from planet to planet like locusts and they eat everything in their path. Literally, they will leave a planet drained even of its atmosphere. They harvest the whole planet. They consume all of that biomass and they use it to make more tyranid using gene splicing techniques. Now, the reason why our xenobiologist says it's unlikely that they came about by evolution is because this would be like locusts becoming spacefaring. But if locusts were the dominant species on Earth, there would be no Earth left. There wouldn't be time to evolve into being a space-traveling species. But in the Warhammer 40k world, it is entirely possible that somebody bioengineered them or that they got kicked out of the warp. So what do the Tyranids teach us about designing aggressive insectoid species? The first thing to bear in mind is that they have a hive mind. They all think the same way, and the queens who are in control of the various ships can communicate via the hive mind. More properly, I suppose, they communicate via the synapse, but... Eh, potato, potato in the case of analyzing what we're talking about here. The driving force of the Tyranid is survival. They are literally just driven to survival. The very interesting thing about the Tyranids is that when they appear in a system, they cast a shadow in the warp, and that shadow makes it so that nobody else's warp magic works. So NIDs can literally prevent warp magic from leaving a system or warp magic from working within a system, which obviously offers them a massive advantage. What makes the NIDs so interesting is that very concept of the hive mind. Because they're all connected, they all drive in the same direction. You can't bribe a gene stealer. You can't convert it to the empire. You can't turn it into a spy. It is connected to the hive mind. It is part of the single organism that is the NID. And if you are designing a species like that, you would do well to consider that species to be one entity with multiple expressions of itself, which are its various specialized workers military nids versus the worker type nids versus the gene stealers versus the lictors, etc, etc. That hive mind concept also carries through to designing a 
insectoid species as good guy sentient species, which Raymond faced and Jenny Wirtz did in the Empire of Turani with their insect race, the Chuya. The Chuya also have a hive mind and they also have queens. Now, what happens here is you have drones whose job it is to impregnate the queen almost continuously, and then she gives birth to whatever the hive needs most. If the hive needs more workers, she'll produce more workers. If the hive needs more warriors, she'll produce more warriors. And then very rarely, the queens can produce magician chuya, who are cast the chuya, who can use their innate magic. It's quite popular when you're building a sentient insectoid species to go with the hive insects and to build a hive mind concept in it as well as normally a matriarchy. Matriarchy does seem to pull through quite strongly into the insect world. Mostly it seems to be queens who control the hives. And in terms of the more singleton insects like spiders and praying mantises and so on, it seems to be more than once that the female of the species will eat the male of the species after copulation in order to ensure that she has the nutrients for the next generation to carry on. So if you build a sentient species that have got like a praying mantis style of baseline, I wonder what your male's attitude towards mating is. I wonder if your male at that point might have this strong desire to just be gay uh, and avoid mating with a female until he goes into kind of like a frenzy of a desire to carry on his genes and then the female calls him with her pheromones because, you know, you only get to mate with a female once. It would be a very interesting society to build around that principle of you know how you're going to die if you're a man. You're going to get your head bitten off right after you've successfully copulated with a female. Anyway, so so much for sentient species. As I said, often hive and very often matriarchal based. In the hive, by the way, the male maters, the guys who can actually get to have their genes carry on, they're normally mindless. So it's not exactly a plum cushy job to be (laughs) a queen's mate in any form of the insect world. If you like this look at sentience of insectoids, Hit the thumbs up button and let's move on to domestication. Insects are in some ways absolutely amazing to domesticate. They have a short breeding cycle so you can observe changes made in their breeding partners very rapidly. The hive insects, of course, are very much focused around a family structure But they're very alien, so it's quite hard to take control of the hive, as it were. However, they're not normally that useful to domesticate. They're not big enough to ride. They don't offer a good food source and so on. There are some exceptions. One of those exceptions is the reason why I am wearing this robe today. And that is the silk worm. Now, the silk worm is the larval form of the silk moth. And of course, it spins itself into a cocoon from which it then hatches as a moth. Unless, of course, the cocoon is grabbed and turned into actual silk cloth. Now, you might be sitting there going, oh, but that's only fabric. But remember, before we could synthesize fabric, Such a thing as silk was incredibly valuable. It feels great on the skin. It's hard wearing. It is an excellent material. It was discovered in China and they kept its manufacturing a secret. It had to be imported from China by Europe. And it was for many, many centuries. Then there were two monks who talked their way into the presence of Emperor Justinian, the Hagia Sophia Emperor Justinian. And they convinced him that they could steal the secret of silk manufacture from China. Now, because Justinian's coffers were running quite low, he agreed to let these two monks try. One of the things that protected the Chinese silk industry was that it would be very hard 
to keep the silkworms alive on a journey from China. But these two monks were actually quite smart. First, they spent two years getting mulberry tree cuttings and getting those transported west so that there would be enough mulberry leaves for the silkworms. Then they went to China and they learned the secrets of silk making from the peasants who worked on the silk manufacturing plants. And they didn't steal silk worms. What they did was they got the moths inside their canes. Their canes were hollow, so they unscrewed it. So they got moths inside their canes and got them to lay silkworm eggs in the canes. And then they carried those canes with the silkworm eggs back to the west. And then when the silkworms hatched, they had the process for making silk and they had enough silkworms with which to start their own silk manufacturing process. And that is the first documented case of commercial espionage. And it was to steal insects. So that is something you can build into your world. If you have control of an insect type, you can have control of its output. And its output can be something as valuable as silk. The trade route to China was called the Silk Road because so much silk traveled back to the west along that trade route because silk was so extremely valuable. So it's definitely worth thinking about where such insects live, how they produce the material that's turned into cloth or fabric, and who wants it and who controls those insects. Give this video a thumbs up if you thought that bit of commercial es espionage was cool. Silkworms aren't our only domesticated insects. We've also domesticated the honeybee. Bees are actually a two-product animal. The first is their wax. Bees' wax was incredibly valuable in the Middle Ages. It was used to make candles with because the candles burnt odorless and with a clearer flame than tallow candles. Bees' wax was also used to make royal sealing wax, to polish tables with, to make leather waterproof, a whole range of uses came from beeswax itself. And of course, honey is an extremely valuable product. Not only is honey sweet, but it is also antibacterial and was used to keep wounds from getting infected. You see, honey is a supersaturated solution. It doesn't have enough water in it to allow the bacteria to live and it draws them out of the wound into the honey, and then they literally die inside the honey without leaving any bad consequences behind. And that is why honey was used to prevent bacterial infection in wounds. Honey, of course, is also a food that keeps for that same reason. Bacteria can't infect it and can't make it go off. Of course, some kinds of honey literally contain antibacterial, like be defense in one, or the honey made from the Manaluka flower from New Zealand. Now, why did I suddenly have this segment where I sound like a honey commercial? It's because honey, and by extension the honey bee, can, in my opinion, contribute enormously to your magic system if you approach it from the perspective of its life-giving properties. Honey can form the root of your healing potions. Honey bees could be used to cover an injured man and bring healing to him. You could use beeswax to withdraw poison from somebody's flesh. You know, obviously these are not things you can use in our world, but that doesn't stop you from using these bee products in that way in your magic system and really leaning into that healing property that honey has that is the byproduct of bees and making bees part of your magic system. And then, of course, on a yin-yang principle, you could make the bee sting the one thing that bees can't cure. So there's always this kind of twist in the tail. I think that would be a very interesting healing system to base it into that kind of insectoid honey kind of world of, of the bee. I should add, so far, I've only spoken about normal-sized insects and normal-sized people. But of course, 
this is fantasy. You could go with giant insects or small people, the way the 2013 movie Epic did, where it was fairy-type people. They were riding dragonflies as mounts, and they had insects performing all kinds of tasks and, of course, presenting all kinds of dangers. Because if you make insects bigger, you're suddenly talking about a whole different league here. And that segues me nicely into monsters. Spiders are probably the most famous insect monsters. From Shelob in Lord of the Rings to the Harry Potter's Aragog. I am deathly afraid of spiders, so I am not going to show you any or talk about them anymore. If you want to see those movies, go see them. They make terrifying monsters. Let's move on to scorpions. I use a scorpion in my world. It's called a Napan, and it is the size of a medium-sized dog. My main character, Louis, in fact, faces one of these creatures in combat. Now, these Napans are a naturally evolved creature in my world because my oxygen levels are slightly more elevated than Earth's oxygen levels. Not quite at the Carboniferous period, so we're not talking like 35% oxygen levels, but say 26-27% rather than Earth's 21%. And hence, my insects can naturally be far larger. What makes the scorpion so dangerous is not just its size. Obviously, it has big pincers and so on, but its poison gland is correspondingly bigger. Its poison is not more dangerous than, say, a brown house scorpion. But rather than getting a thimbleful of poison into you, it can get a syringe filled with poison into you with the length of its stinger. And that is what makes the napan so very, very dangerous. If you're building insectoid monsters and you're going to blow them up to a large size, don't just think about their claws. Think about things like what happens to their poison. Not that it becomes stronger, but what happens if you can get a lot more into a person? It is worth giving some consideration to all of the extras around insects that the rest of us don't normally have, like poisons. Of course, you can also have magic involved in the creation of giant insects, the way that Jim Butcher did in his novel Stormfront, the first Harry Dresden book. Now, I did go into some detail about the scorpion amulet, which you can check out in my deconstruction of how to create a mystery in the information cards. But in short summary, there is a amulet that blows up to become a huge scorpion that chases Harry through the corridors of his building and in fact destroys the lift of his building with its claws and its weight and its tail and all the rest of its really, really bad hardcore shenanigans. If you really want to frighten your enemies, go right ahead and blow up a standard type of insect to giant size and then send it after them. Indeed, I have another giant insect in my world, which is the Gravastor, which is based on the mole cricket. And that one is actually controlled through magic and it digs the canals that ensures that Somfa remains the major trading town in the empire of Lumiaron. And if you're interested in reading more about my insects, a link to my book down below. So in summary, insects provide you with some amazing plot and magic opportunities. If you look at how insects interact with the world around us and you lean into that as your magic for insects, you can come up with some really interesting and unique twists on what are common magical attributes, but now with added insectness. You can use insects as a commercial tool and have an entire commercial espionage story told around control of those insects. You can, of course, use insects as monsters, either natural or with a magical basis. If you make them big enough, you can also make them domesticatable and have people riding on dragonflies. And of course, they always look weird, different and fantastic. And that is my take on insects in a fantasy world. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Just in Time Worlds. Please do give it a thumbs up if you did. 
Also, please do let me know in the comments below what other animal kingdoms you would like me to deep dive into and discuss how to use them in a fantasy world. And I will see you soon for another one.